Good morning, family. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you find these messages to be helpful. If so, will you do me a favor? Will you subscribe to my video channel? Thanks. I sure do appreciate it. Today, Mark helps us to wrestle with a critical question in our personal spiritual journeys. But before we tackle that crucial question, let's first find our footing in the Word of God. Our Gospel reading today is found in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus and his disciples are in a place called Caesarea Philippi. It's named for two kings, Caesar and Philip. Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. Caesarea Philippi was known for all of its altars and temples to people of great renown and to the pantheon of Greek and Roman gods. In the middle of all this hero worship, Jesus asks his disciples and us pivotal questions, the second more significant than the first. Are you ready? Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They told him, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, And what about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then after three days rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who is Jesus? Have you ever been asked that question? Have you asked it of yourself, or does this seem like nonsense? It would seem natural to think that after 2,000 or so years of Christian history, we shouldn't have to ask such a question. But then again, this is a fundamental question that each of us must answer for ourselves. Who is Jesus? We're in the Gospel according to Mark. So the other day, I decided to do a little survey to find all the things, all the titles, all the names that Mark attributed to Jesus. Why? Because I'm a nerd, and that's the kind of thing that I do. In Mark's Gospel, Mark gives Jesus several different titles. Christ, or Messiah, both of which mean anointed one, the one chosen and sent by God. He was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth a link to his hometown. Son of David, he was in the family line of Israel's great king. Son of man, he was fully human while being fully God. Son of God and beloved son. Jesus was also called Lord, a title of authority. The physician, the sower, the stone the builders rejected. Jesus was also called teacher or rabbi. They mean the same thing. He was referred to as a prophet, and at his crucifixion, Jesus was called the King of the Jews. Does that help us answer the question, who is Jesus? In his account of the life of Jesus, Mark takes us to the very heart of the gospel, the very heart of the good news that God is for us and not against us. The story we read a moment ago came at a critical time in Jesus' relationship with his disciples 
and with his friends. It was a moment when the truth of what God was doing in and through Jesus came into its sharpest focus. It was an encounter that clarified once and for all the answer to the question, who is Jesus? Certainly for each of us and for each and every generation, our understanding of who Jesus is cuts to the core of our personal faith. What Peter and the other disciples experienced 2,000 years ago is what we go through again and again as we decide if we will match what we say we believe about Jesus with how we follow Jesus in our daily lives. In today's story, Jesus is near the end of his public ministry. The cross is looming on the horizon. So Jesus asked his closest allies if they truly understood what God was doing in and through him. He wanted and he needed his disciples to know where everything was going. The end, his death, was going to be very confusing and disheartening. He wanted them to understand that it was all for the sake of the world. So Jesus asked his dearest disciples what the people were saying about him. Now, I'm pretty sure that he already knew. His disciples gave several answers. Some think you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Others say that you're Elijah come back to life again. I heard someone say that you're one of the prophets, or maybe even a new modern-day prophet. But that was just the warm-up act. What Jesus really wanted to know was who his friends thought he was and what they thought about him. Peter, the one guy who was always quick to act, the one most likely to stick his foot in his mouth, spoke boldly for the rest of the group. You are the Messiah, Peter announced. Somehow, Peter understood that Jesus was the one God sent to fulfill God's promises in this world. Jesus was the one that God chose and sent to love and save the world. That's what the title Messiah really means. Upon hearing Peter's declaration, Jesus might have thought to himself, so far, so good, right? But the truth is, the disciples did not fully understand who Jesus was or what he was all about. Jesus knew that Peter and the others still interpreted the meaning of Messiah the old way. The old way interpreted God through the lens of enemy hatred rather than enemy love. Jesus came to change that. The disciples were still people of the old way. They thought in terms of us versus them instead of us for them. The disciples were more impressed by power than by love. So they were on the lookout for a mighty warrior. They expected someone to set Israel free from their Roman oppressors. They wanted someone to make Israel great again. But that was not Jesus' mission. It was obvious that Jesus had to do some more teaching, right? Oh, and don't forget, the clock was ticking for Jesus. He was on his way, ultimately, to Jerusalem to give his life for the world. So to teach and test his disciples further, Jesus told them what it meant for him to be the Messiah. He described what it would take for the world to be saved. Jesus began to prep them for what would happen during Holy Week, the week that would cost him his life and intimidate his followers. So as any good teacher would, Jesus began to discuss his upcoming trial, crucifixion, death, and his resurrection. And that's when Peter proved that he really did not get it. With his characteristic brashness, Peter scolded Jesus for talking about his coming death a turn of events that would make Jesus look weak, an ending that would look like losing, like failing. And who can blame him, right? He didn't like what he heard. He tried to correct Jesus' version of the story because it did not fit his view of how God would, or should, save the world. It didn't fit his understanding of who Jesus was. Imagine how much it must have troubled Jesus to receive this kind of treatment from one of his disciples. Peter's harshness toward Jesus was so stark and challenging that Jesus had to respond strongly to challenge the misunderstanding. And did you catch what he said to Peter? 
He called him Satan. Jesus insisted that that viewpoint was human thinking and not God trusting. Jesus might have expected this, which is probably why he repeatedly told his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Why? Because they did not fully understand who Jesus was or what it all meant. And if the 12 disciples don't fully understand who Jesus is and what it means for him to be the Messiah, then how could other people possibly understand, right? The disciples did not know. They did not yet understand that the gift of God in Jesus, the love, the grace, the forgiveness poured out through him, all came at a price. A price not only for Jesus, but for his followers and family too. To follow Jesus, to walk the way of God, Jesus said, requires going against some of the most basic urges of human nature. According to Jesus, following him requires that anyone who wants to follow Jesus must deny their own needs and desires and speaking words that could only truly be grasped after Jesus' death and resurrection. We must take up our own crosses, like the one Jesus bore on his way to die on Calvary. Spiritually speaking, focusing on saving our own life is the surest way to lose it. Every value of the world, Jesus said, pales in comparison to what we can gain by living a life with God. That is the nature of who Jesus is. That is what it means to know him as Savior and to follow him in the way of God. That is how it becomes personal for us. That is how we match what we say we believe with how we follow Jesus in the actions of our daily lives. To confess that Jesus is our Savior means following him willingly into salvation. Today's gospel reminds us that to follow Jesus is to deny ourselves, to lose ourselves, to let go of the ego, to put ourselves aside for the sake of greater values to sacrifice for the good of others in the world. It means giving up ourselves for others in the way of sacrifice and unselfishness. It means, like Jesus, giving what you have to those who need it. Following Jesus means letting the will of God take the place of our own will. It means giving up particular interests or time or possessions when the purposes of God require it. It is putting God, not ourselves, at the center of life. We must, in the words of our baptismal covenant, renounce all sinful desires that draw us from the love of God. The figurative cross that we carry when following Jesus represents the price we pay for our Christianity. It is what we call the cost of discipleship. That's the way we remain connected with God. So we're talking about something here called discipleship because Jesus was talking to his disciples about discipleship. Discipleship is the process of continually articulating our faith, refining it as we go, understanding it more and more as we live it and do it. But as Peter shows us, discipleship is also wrestling with our difficulties and our objections to Jesus' identity and to his mission. Which means that, like with his disciples that day in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus will continually counter our struggles and our hesitations. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if we could say now, okay, I get it. I get who Jesus is and what he expects of me. I can check that box. But the life of discipleship is a journey. It's not an instantaneous accomplishment. It's a life in which we express both our faith, you are the Messiah, as well as our fears. Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. And living a life of discipleship is how we come to an answer to the question, who is Jesus? Though the answer, the response of losing our selfishness for the sake of God is highly personal, we do not act upon it alone. Oh, and by the way, if you're worried about Peter getting crossways with Jesus, don't worry. Over in the gospel, according to John, Peter comes face to face with the risen Lord. And in that encounter with Jesus, Peter was forgiven for his earlier doubts and abandonment. And Jesus also gave him energy and direction and purpose 
for future discipleship and sacrifice. And the good news is, it's the same for us as well. Jesus forgives us when we get it wrong and wander off the path. And he gives us energy, direction, and purpose to move forward carrying our own cross. By the way, we don't have to carry our crosses alone. We get to carry crosses in the company of a faithful band of followers of Jesus. We have the example of Jesus, and we have the example of Peter, and we have each other too. Together, we support one another for the difficult challenge Jesus sets before us. And we go forth into the world and into the week so we can act out and live out our answer to the question, who is Jesus? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Good and gentle God, whose love brings healing to lives that are broken and to the hungry bread, whose word is comfort when walking in darkness and grace to those in need, we bring our grateful thanks. Compassionate and loving God, whose love has no end and no beginning, yet lives within our hearts, whose grace is precious, beyond understanding, yet offered to us all, we bring our grateful thanks. Help us today and every day to live out our love for you and for others. May the content of our lives display our belief that Jesus is the Messiah. May our lives reflect his love and compassion. Today, Father, we remember and pray for those who are in need, especially those who are ill. Again, we pray for those who are afflicted and affected by COVID-19. Give us wisdom, direction, and protection, we pray. We pray for everyone dealing with or dreading natural disasters and for those who are seeking refuge, asylum, and safety. Help us, your disciples, to bring and to be your love and your healing to those who desperately need it. Help us to comfort and care for those who are the last, the least, the lost, and the left out. And now using the words debts and debtors, let us pray with boldness the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. Was this message helpful to you? If so, will you share this video with three friends this week? Also, your job this week is to love at least three people and make sure at least one of them doesn't deserve it because everyone needs love and everyone needs to know that God loves them no matter what, right? Please don't let all the responsibilities and busyness of life rob you of your joy. With Jesus, we always, always, always have hope. Now receive these words of benediction today. May the Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.